welcome to a special Platinum Jubilee episode of Palace Confidential. This week I have one guest, but what a guest he is. Andrew Morton has written some of the most read and talked about royal biographies of our time, and his new book, entitled The Queen, is a fascinating look at the life of Her Majesty, and he is here today. Andrew, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. I wanted to ask you, The Queen must be something of an anomaly for biographers. She never gives interviews. She never really, we never really know what the Queen is thinking for sure, but everybody's got an opinion of her. So how do you go about tackling a subject like that? Yes, it's the first question you ask yourself, who is the woman behind the mask? Yes. And it's something I, I dealt with throughout my writing career with, with the Queen. What is the real person behind the figurehead, behind the icon? Because she herself, recognises that she's an icon. I mean, when Michael Fagan broke, in, broke into her bedroom in, back in 1982 and she was sleeping alone, she realised that, you know, she understood why he'd done it mm -hmm. because he saw her as the fount of all matriarchy, of, as, as the, you know, kind of the gr great mother of us all. That's incredible. So how do you go about digging under that? Well... I've been writing about the royal family for 40 years and I've discovered that everybody has got a little story about about the Queen. And you'll notice a few things yourself when you've followed her around. I mean, you know, my first sight of the Queen was in, it was in California in 1983 on her, a, a tour there that if it had been called, if it had been a West End play, it would have been the tour that went wrong because, you know, there were, typh there were hurricanes, there were... IRA demonstrations, everything went wrong. But one of the things that I noticed was that when the Queen went for a walk, she was being followed by secret servicemen. She, she, was, she and Prince Philip were deeply irritated by that. British bodyguards know to keep their distance. So they fooled around with them. And, and in the end, everybody starts, everybody starts laughing. But it was one of those things where you get a little insight into her character and a little insight into the fact that you know she quite likes it when things go wrong she quite likes it when you know when she's left alone so she, she must have loved the last year then so <laughs> but the, the, the point i'm trying to make is that is that you get these little insights all the time you know that her love of scottish dancing for example um uh, and the fact that she's got a very dry sense of humor that that we all saw with some of these interchanges um, with the Queen during lockdown, mm. when her indoors, as it were, reached out to a wider uh, international audience. Now, obviously, you're most famous for your biography of Diana. Did you recalibrate any of your thoughts on Diana after doing this book? Yes, I, I mean, there was no need for any recalibration in the sense that the book's title tells you all you need to know. Diana, her true story. It was about her, her perspective. But obviously, seeing that that whole drama working out with Diana as she, uh, during her early days inside the royal family, her bulimia and so on, and how did the Queen respond to it? And was she more um, forgiving, more more sympathetic than Diana perhaps uh, felt at the time? And I think the answer is yes. Yes, tell me more about that because I think that there's a lot of history being proclaimed from the Netflix series, The Crown. And there's, there's great swathes of the public who really believe this black and white story of Diana being frozen out of the royal family, but it, it wasn't necessarily the case, was it? No, and, and to be fair to The Crown, they've always said that this is fiction. Uh, with, it, it looks so fancy and based factual, Based on the though. factual background. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing for me is that, is that the, the Queen did take a, a, you know, a, a real interest and, and concern about this unravelling marriage. And, it's, and in many respects, it, 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 it showed her own character. She was prepared to kick, the, as it were, the can down the road in the hope that there might be a resolution. But of course, there wasn't. Prince Charles, as we all know, went on television and proclaimed his adultery. Mm. Diana, of course, did her panorama interview, which we know was kind of, you know, she was conned into doing. But nonetheless, it created this atmosphere where the monarchy was being uh, being besmirched, being being attacked. And that's, I think, that's where you see the Queen draw a line. She's prepared to take some. Uh, uh, 
staining, as it were, of the monarchy, but not, but not f for, for the institution not to be totally attacked. Mm. Well, we were talking uh, before we started recording about, I was fascinated by this idea that the Queen was quite engaged and quite happy to talk about the marriage problems with her daughters-in-law, Sarah Ferguson and Diana. Is that what you found? I find that fascinating. <laughs> well, it's, it's not something that she w w was desperate to do. I mean, the first person that she ended up talking about marriage and infidelity and, and divorce was, of course, her sister. Mm. When, first of all, she fell for Group Captain Peter Townsend, who was divorced. And this is virtually in the first few weeks of, of her reign. And then, of course, during this whole, the whole breakdown of the marriage of Margaret and Lord Snowden, that, you know, which started with such good wishes and high hopes. They were, lest we forget, the most glamorous couple in the world apart from Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Mm. Uh, they, they really were, the, you know, the face of the swinging 60s. So the, so the Queen has had to address these kinds of marital issues all the way through her reign. So it wasn't just Diana and Fergie. And remember, of course, there's Princess Anne lurking in the background uh, with her uh, private detective. I suppose we, we do rather have this image of the Queen as being much more comfortable with her red dispatch box, um, avoiding conflict. Yeah. Do you think that that aspect of her character has strongly defined her life and her role? I think that, that initially the Queen was certainly what her policy was to wait and see, was utter caution. And you've seen over the years, as she's become more experienced in the role, she'd be more decisive and to the point where when Meghan and Harry decided to leave, she instructed her private secretaries to work, and I quote, at pace. Uh, with, and then also she came out with that interesting phrase, um, I think... Recollections may, may vary. Recollections yeah. may vary. Yeah. From, that was from her pen in relation to members of her family. So you're seeing someone who is now consummately in control, I think. Mm, I think obviously one of the uh, most famous ironically, periods of the Queen's life was after the death of Diana. Uh, and you write about Charles weeping and phoning Camilla. Well, not just phoning Camilla, but phoning his, his aides in, in London and, and being immediately aware that this was going to be possibly catastrophic, that he would be blamed for her death in this, in, in this kind of curious logic that we have. And it, by and large, he was right. I mean, people did feel that if he'd, if he'd worked harder at the marriage and hadn't been with Camilla, uh, that the Diana wouldn't have uh, uh, been separated and divorced and could be living today. So mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a logic to how he felt about it. But those uh, first dreadful hours at Balmoral were ones where n nobody quite knew what was going on. Mm. And remember, and people always forget this, the Spencer family wanted a private funeral initially. And that was their... And, and, and the Queen said, well, fine, because she's not a member of the royal family anymore. Yeah, but it's interesting because I really... Um, one of my overriding memories of that whole period was the groundswell of animosity towards the Queen and, and her, percept, her perceived way of handling that mourning period in, in the public eye. But your book has to dispel some of the myths about this supposedly cold queen that everybody felt. Yes, I mean, I, I think I, I've charted a thread all the way through the book. And I find, and, it, and this, this comes as something of a revelation to myself, that she was a great mother to her sister, Margaret, even when she was born. She, I mean, people, she thought she was a doll for her to play with. She mothered her father, George VI, who suffered from what they called gnashes, these uncontrollable bursts of temper. So she was able to kind of mother him and settle him down. And then all the way through her life, I mean, with Mountbatten, when Mountbatten was assassinated, she looked after uh, the Mountbatten, uh, the Natchbull children. So, mm. you know, the mothering side of her has been as it were, foregone what, with this, this image of her with the red boxers and with the dogs and with the horses and seeking succour there. But she is, I, I think, and then we've seen over the last couple of years this kind of matriarchal figure mm. uh, who, is very, who is very relaxed in her role. Do you think that summer of 1997, Diana's passing, do you think that fundamentally changed the Queen in some ways? I think the Queen herself has said so. Mm. I mean, that lessons had to be learned and lessons were learned. And 
the idea now of a of a white gloved big big handbag uh, do not uh, uh, touch monarchy is very much part of the past what is what one of the points i make in the book is that change has been incremental and quite slow i mean some of the most um uh, drastic changes in the monarchy only took place 10 years ago 2013 with with the the, the revision of the finances uh, yeah. the, uh, and the, the abolition of the acts of succession and and so on so that so that um, you know and the the basic prejudice that was incorporated into our laws against roman catholics has been dispelled and mm. of course women Tell us about her complicated relationship with the son and heir. How has the relationship between Charles and the Queen evolved from the point of Diana's death? Well, when Diana died, I mean, as far as the Queen and the Queen Mother were concerned, Camilla was not wanted on board. And um, the Queen made that perfectly clear that uh, Prince Charles should, should, for the sake of the monarchy, give up his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. He refused to do that. And that caused a rift between mother and son that lasted for some time. And it wasn't helped by the fact that uh, Prince Charles authorised a biography of him where, uh, where he, you know, the, the, the writer, uh, Jonathan Dimbleby, made clear that um, Charles felt that his mother was cold and distant. And that, that more than anything Diana said, actually, mm. that kind of define the relationship and define people's perceptions of the Queen. Now, over the years, you know, Charles talks about your majesty, dot, 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 mummy, and always gets a laugh and a round of applause. And in public, they seemed far more affectionate than, than they were before. And that indeed has come about because of um, the, the fact that Camilla and Charles after much struggle and much opposition from the Queen, finally, as it were, uh, uh, won the Grand National, as to, to misquote the Queen, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and uh, married in 2005. Since then, we've seen a, an incremental change of where uh, the Queen has given Camilla Privy Council status, uh, Order of the Garter, and then, of course, more recently, saying that uh, she would like... Uh, Camilla to be Queen Consort. It, it is fascinating, this acceptance of Camilla as a future Queen, when there was a time when the Queen wouldn't even be in the same room, the same event as her. Well, yes, where the Queen organised one of the biggest parties ever for the Queen Mother's 100th uh, and various other members of the royal family, their, their, their birthdays and special years, and she wasn't on the guest list, oh, even for, I think, Prince Charles's 50th. Mm. Uh, she wasn't on the guest list. So she she was not wanted on board. I suppose as well for the Queen in that, you know, the older generation of the monarchy, she her marriage was so consistent and the Duke of Edinburgh was so constant in her life. So that was her understanding of that that kind of relationship. But that must have been devastating to make that adjustment for her in recent times. Well, again, looking back, Edward VII had a long-term mistress whom his wife, Queen Alexandra, allowed uh, to go to his deathbed. Mm. Mrs Kettle related obscurely to Camilla Parker Bowles. Well, it's, it's funny you mention that because there have always been rumours of Prince Philip's extramarital affairs. Is that something that you think the Queen expected loyalty, not necessarily fidelity? Well, that's a point I make in the book, yeah. that, that, she, that she's from a generation that expected loyalty, not necessarily fidelity. But even so, it's been a, it's been a brave biographer who said that Prince Philip cheated on her. As, <laughs> as, as, he, as, he, as he said when, he, when asked, I think by an Australian journalist, how on earth could I arrange something like that? I've got a detective with, with me all the time. Forgetting, of course, that Prince Charles arranged that for a good 10 years. It's interesting, isn't it? You were talking about Charles sort of pretty much throwing his mother under the bus in Jonathan Dimbleby's book. I don't remember, I, maybe I just don't remember, I don't remember the furore in the same way with Harry making remarks about Charles's parenting abilities. Well, and there are more remarks to come because he's yeah. got his book coming out. So, I mean, if I was Prince Charles, I'd be looking for a pile of coats to hide under. <laughs> It's fascinating. Uh, 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 but having said that, I think that an awful lot of his book will be about 
about, about you know his, his mother his his days in the in his 10 years he spent in the army yeah. and um uh, uh you know obviously there'll be some controversy there mm. now this is a bit that really fascinated me talking about the queen and her 1990s era emotional maelstrom and even a suggestion that she was drinking more than usual she struggled in one in, in 1990, 1982 and 1992 with, with this with these things that were going on i mean you know from a man to break into your bedroom um and then to, to keep them talking for a, for a few minutes yes it was calming but uh, it showed you her calmness but it also you know it was terrifying as well then there were, there were various bomb explosions in central london um f close friends died and for a time uh she went to betty parsons uh, a breathing expert uh for 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 kind of consolation for physical consolation to to calm her, you know, to, to calm her down do you think how how do you think that compares to the recent, shall we say, challenges that the royal family have been through with Andrew's controversy, with the Mexit revelations, etc. Do you think that she is now of a mind that there's nothing could really break her after that period of tumult? I think when you've had somebody break into your bedroom. Yeah. I think when you've lost friend, very close friends. I think when you know when you've seen uh, horses and soldiers just slaughtered, uh, it, it, and also. You know, members of your family the, the, with the Mountbatten assassination, uh, everything else is fairly straightforward, mm. and and also the, the, an awful lot of the um, rage, Queen, you know, fury. dot dot com um, is 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 manipulated by the media to to a degree. Mm. Uh, I think the Queen takes a fairly sanguine view of of things that are going on. Witness the fact that, you know, when Harry and Meghan decided to leave, work at pace. That was her instruction. Mm. But do you think that um, there is some projection from quarters that she would be devastated by Harry moving to America? Or And obviously there is the grieving period of uh, losing Prince Philip. But do you think that she's handled those things with a little bit more perspective than... Uh, yes, I think, think? That's, I think that's a good point. Yeah. And also, uh, Prince Harry going to California, well... Let's just remind ourselves that the Queen went to Malta uh, for several years after she married Prince Philip. And remember, they always anticipated that George VI would last, would live a lot longer. And mm. and they and and Philip's ambition was to be first sea lord, uh, mm. and he was seen as a, a star in the making. And that was and and so the Queen herself will have reflected on the fact that well, Harry wants to live in California with a, an American wife from California. So be it. The Queen's made it perfectly clear the direction of travel of the royal family is the immediate heirs. Mm. Yes. And, and I'm looking forward to the headline, and I'll project it for the next week or the week after, when Lilibet met Lilibet. Oh, there you go. There we are. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm looking forward to that headline. Um, but the Queen has faced criticism uh, for the handling of Andrew's disgraceful period, his exile. Do you, how do you think that she is feeling about all of that situation? Well, I, I think that, you know, every time she's allowed a member of the royal family to put a microphone near them, there's been catastrophe. Um, there was anything to do with television and the royal family, you know, somehow make, make a, it, it just goes all wrong. Um, first of all, Prince Edward and the, it's a royal knockout, which you know made the royal family a laughing stock. You've got Prince Charles, of course, t talking about his adultery on TV. Diana and the famous panorama, panorama, panorama mm. interview. Then you've got Meghan and Harry and and uh, Oprah. So anything to do with television is not smart. Uh, and so really, the Queen and Prince Charles, who made the original, the final decision to let Prince Andrew go on the BBC. Um, uh, the, quite rightly, they were criticised for it. Do you think that uh, some people have accused her of putting motherhood above duty? Do you think that's fair? The irony is the Queen's been accused of putting duty above motherhood for most, for most <laughs> of her true. life. Very yeah. true. So, so, <laughs> By Charles. And, and then, and then <laughs> when, when uh, Diana dies, she's accused of, you know, being cold and indifferent because she's put the 
William and Harry first. Um, with with the Andrew situation, she can only go on the best advice that she's given. And remember, Prince Andrew thought he'd done a wonderful job, phones up the Queen and ma makes it clear to everybody, mission accomplished, to the point where he's showing all the Newsnight fam um, camera crew around Buckingham Palace um, to, to, uh, because he was so thrilled with the way he'd done I'm his job. I'm cringing already again just hearing that. It's incredible. I mean, yeah. But ultimately, the decision was that made by, as he said, as Andrew said himself, the upstairs. What do you think, um, how do you think, rather, that history will depict the Queen ultimately? Well, I think that the, the one thing we haven't talked about is the Commonwealth and the, the, the end of the British Empire. And the Queen has, has reigned over a period of of retrenchment in Britain. And there's been very little civil dis, uh, disobedience, disturbance compared to other countries who had empires. And I think that the Queen's, one of, one of her great strengths has been the fact that she's brought calm to a, a turbulent nation. She's tried. <laughs> we don't make it easy sometimes. <laughs> that is all we have time for on Palace Confidential this week. My thanks to Andrew Morton. A reminder that his book, the Queen, I'm going to show you, is out now, published by Michael O'Mara Books, and we'll be back with a regular show next week. Wishing you a happy Platinum Jubilee from all of us here at Palace Confidential. Bye-bye for now.